myth busting. That's what I'm doing today. Today I'm going to be busting the 50% rule. This is your show. This is the show where I work for you directly, taking your needs. I'm going through the MLS and I'm trying to find the best possible deal for you guys. Put down 25%. That's the perfect way to buy this. That's why real estate investing is the greatest industry in the world. Welcome to the MLS Search and Analysis Show. This is Holton Wise TV and I am your boy, James Wise. And today, I'm going to be doing uh, two things. One, I'm going to be busting the 50% rule myth, right? And two, I'm going to be helping out local investor, my man from Rocky River, Mike, right? My man Mike is interested in a seven-unit apartment building. And Mike, I'm going to go through that thing with you top to bottom. Make sure we figure everything out for you so you can make the most informed decision. And while we do that, while we talk about that, folks... We are going to be talking about the 50% rule, right? Because I think a lot of you guys, I guess the name itself, right? That's what's confusing a lot of you guys. The 50% rule, like it's a rule, right? Rule of thumb, like it's always going to happen, right? For the viewers out there who may not know what the hell I'm talking about. Oh, the 50% rule, man. That's cool, right? The 50% rule is a general rule of thumb, right? It's like cocktail napkin math. When you're analyzing a rental property, uh, you could reasonably assume that roughly half of the rents are going to go towards your operating expenses, right? Your fixed and variable expenses, right? Taxes, property management, maintenance, you know, utilities, things of that nature, right? 50%, okay? So a lot of people uh, will look at a property and go, oh, it brings in $1,000 a month in rent. So that means it's going to net $500. That means it's going to net $6,000 for the year, right? Just very simple math, right? That is just the very, very, very beginning, folks. Don't actually make a purchase based on the 50% rule, right? That is just quick cocktail napkin math. That is just something... Uh, to look at right off the rip. You have to actually dive deeper into the actual expenses. Now, I'm going to throw another curveball at you, though. When I say actual expenses, here's the other thing. When you're analyzing a rental property, there is no such thing as like knowing a full scope of the real actual expenses at some level there will always be variables. There is always going to be an unlimited amount of variables at play. Some of your expenses, you could determine. For instance, your taxes, right? You can figure out what those are going to be, right? You get a yearly tax bill, you divide it by 12, right? Those are your monthly tax costs, right? Insurance, right? Same thing. But then there's other other costs that you'll never be able to get an actual number. You still have to estimate it, right? But there's a way to estimate that number that is more accurate than the 50% rule. And those, right, those expenses, we are talking about repairs and maintenance, vacancy and non-payment, capital expenditures, water and sewer, right? These things are all going to change, right? You can't 100% predict every single month what your water bill is going to be, right? Everybody's different, right? You know, you could have tenant A and tenant B, both single dudes, right? But tenant A takes three showers a day. Tenant B takes three showers a week, right? You don't 100% know. So there's still going to be levels of variability to this, but we can narrow them down more so uh, than utilizing the 50% rule. Because, Mike, the property I'm looking at for you today, right, we are talking about a scheduled gross rent for the year of $45,600, right? But when I run my numbers on this, I'm seeing expenses that are going to be almost $32,000 a year, right? Leaving your NOI under fourteen k, right? If you just simply took the 50% rule, you'd be looking at, what would that be, like twenty two and a half. You would think you're going to make twenty two and a half as an NOI, but in fact, you're about $10,000 shy of that, right? So what I want to do now is take a quick commercial break, then we're going to get into the property, how I came up with those numbers, and then most importantly for you, Mike, what you should do with this property. Lenders, you might be wondering why I'm walking around in a bikini. Because this is America, that's why. Land of the free, home of the brave, the land of opportunity. Like the opportunity to click the link below and advertise your business on Holton Wise TV. 
Welcome back. Let's do the damn thing, folks. Let's do the damn thing. Let's look into this property, all right? 1897 West 74th Cleveland 44102. Hit the market five days ago, priced at 350K. Now, very first thing I'm going to say about this property, I think it's overpriced, right? I think it is overpriced at 350K. I think it's overpriced by a lot. I think it's overpriced by $70,000. I think paying more than $280,000 for this apartment building would be a mistake. That said, I think it's a nice apartment building. But it's only worth, in my opinion, $280,000. But it is quite nice. The first thing I want to do is let's read what the listing agent has to say, okay? Amazing brick beauty. This seven-unit apartment building has a newer boiler and many updates. All units are one bedrooms with a spacious den with fireplace. These one-bedroom units can easily be converted into two-bedroom units and add instant value to the property in this hot location. Conveniently located around Detroit, Shoreway, Tremont, Ohio City, and downtown close to Edgewater, please call for your private showing today, right? So a couple things I want to take out of that, right? Uh, the first thing will be the rent roll, all right? Let's look at the rent roll, okay? Put it up on the screen here. Except for number seven, which is the vacant unit, those are the actual rents, right? Assuming unit seven is um, <clears throat> rent ready, I just put that at six hundred, right? So that brings us in thirty-eight hundred or forty-five thousand six hundred for the year. Now, the listing agent is talking about converting one-bedroom units to two-bedroom units to add uh, value, right? Theoretically, they're saying we should be able to get more rent if we do that, right? So as we scroll through the photos of the building, I'm going to get a couple unit pictures. By the way, I mean, this is a pretty decent kitchen. Like, not super updated, but it's it's not terrible. Um, it's like what you have here, right? You got the two rooms, and then over here, like, you got uh, the bedroom. That is probably a conversion itself, though, that, like, the tenant did it. Assuming this over here is the bedroom, Uh that would be how that is squared away. Yeah, so, like, they took this room and made it a bedroom. Now, like, you yourself as the landlord going in and, like, quote-unquote converting a room like this to, to get you more money in rent, I mean, it's still the same amount of space, and more or less when these tenants, they look at these uh, these units, like, here's your true bedroom, right? They look at these units. This is what a true bedroom looks like. They're going to essentially convert those other rooms themselves, right? All right, so they're going to convert those other rooms themselves. Like this one, like some people might be thinking, like, oh, what if you take this particular room and convert it? Well, you got the other room on the other side, so it's kind of like bedroom into bedroom, right? But if you have, like, an end room, an extra bonus room, and it's not like a true bedroom, like here's another one. Looks like your tenants already converted it themselves, right? They're pretty much going to do that, right? So as far as, like, what you need to do, like, if you want – uh, you could slap a door on there. You could not slap a door. It's really up to you. Like the one they had the big glass French doors. This one they got a big curtain. So you don't have to like do uh, major work to it. Uh, but in either situation, what I'm trying to say is you do have meat left on the bone, right? These units are actually being rented for lower than they should, right? I think you could probably get most of these up to like seven, seven and a quarter, maybe even seven fifty. Uh, in regards to that neighborhood, right? Because the neighborhood is pretty trendy, right? You're right there off of Detroit Shoreway. But the thing with this particular neighborhood is um, it's like a gentrified neighborhood, right? So you are going to get like low current legacy tenants like this, right? We got people paying five and a quarter, but we could probably get these up to as much as 750, I would say. And that's without like major renovations because you still have the same level of space right now, right? Like right now, you, you you have a one bedroom, but it's like large enough to be a two bedroom. So you can get probably up to seven fifty. If you want to advertise them at as two bedrooms, you can just slap a door on there, call it a day. Like this doesn't require a major overhaul here or anything, right? So we could be going all the way up to seven fifty. And even if you advertise it as a one bedroom with a bonus room, I still think you get the seven fifty, right? Either way, the level of space we have with this neighborhood should deliver you about seven fifty. But that said, you gotta upgrade the units a little bit, right? Like this one, you just need to like repaint it. I like to see the trim as white instead of the natural. I know the natural can be kind of nice, but it seems like tenants 
want the white stuff. And then what you'd want to do is in the kitchens, you want to give them some love, right? If you're trying to hit 750 and you're trying to hit like the trendy folks living in a neighborhood like this, I'd probably go like, you probably don't need to replace these cabinets, but I'd probably paint them like a gray and then do like a nice stone countertop uh, with an undermount sink and then, you know, nice vinyl or flooring. But I wouldn't do that like immediately. I wouldn't kick this particular person who's paying either 600 or five and a quarter out. I would wait till they naturally turned over, then spend like 10K on each unit, uh, making them much nicer to get that premium rent, right? That like 750 or so, right? Because the neighborhood, it's like a gentrified neighborhood, man. So you have like distressed properties, low income properties, but then you have like all the new development and the hipsters and stuff, they're moving into areas like this. So it's definitely like a neighborhood that I would say is on the come up. I mean, you're very, very close to um, Detroit Shoreway, all that jazz, right? This is like the West 80s type neighborhood, right? So it's a little fringy, right? Like, just so you're aware, though, like if you're touring this area, right? Like, you could see like a nice, solid, like townhouse that's going to sell for $500,000, but you could like walk down the street and you'll also be able to buy heroin, right? That's just what it's like, dude. There's fucking crack houses and then fucking new build hipster houses, right? That's, that's just how it is, right? Like, if you're in the Cleveland area, you're living in Rocky River, like, house at the end of the street is nice, house at the other end of the street is nice. All the houses in the middle, they're all nice. Areas like this, where they're on the fringe, it's like nice, 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 whorehouse, crack house, heroin house, nice, nice, nice. I mean, that's just what it is, right? Uh, as more development comes in, I think you'll get less crack houses out there, right? Because, like, pure Detroit Shoreway or pure Gordon Square, right? Much less crack houses that kind of push them out, right? So this one's kind of on the fringe. So. Uh, I wouldn't be nervous investing in this particular area. I think you're going to have a high rental demand, but you do have to understand that, you know, you are going to still see blight uh, with a transitioning neighborhood, right? So with all that said, though, I don't think it makes any sense to move those tenants out now to try to hit the 750. So I want to run the numbers based on your current rents because the worst thing in the world that we as landlords can do is, is get greedy and be like, Oh, they're paying 600 I want 750 and be in a hurry to get those motherfuckers out. You should never be in a hurry to spend fucking 10 grand on a renovation, people. The money's fucking coming in. Collect the fucking money till you can't collect the money anymore. This is a multifamily apartment building, right? Little one-bedroom units. You don't typically get tenants that are going to live in these things for fucking ever, right? They're going to turn over. And that's going to cost you money every time it happens, so don't force the issue just keep collecting the money you're going to get enough natural turnovers you don't force them right so if we run the numbers based upon everything currently right forty five thousand six hundred scheduled to come in but i think we're going to spend thirty one thousand six hundred fifty four ninety six operating this right i know a lot of people look at the 50 percent roll you would think if you do that you're only going to have to spend 22 and a half right but no you got to spend a lot more right reason being right Decent amount of taxes, that's one thing, right? Insurance on these uh, apartment buildings is typically more expensive per unit than you're going to see on, like, small multifamily, right? Like, small multifamily buildings, right? Like, you could get uh, a two-unit building, right? A duplex, right? You could freaking insure that for, like, 800 bucks a year. That's 400 a unit, right? But on these bigger buildings, you're going to be spending, uh, you know, considerable amount of money right because you have to do uh different levels of policy and it just gets more expensive right and then the other thing this building has uh that's going to add some cost here right that you might not expect is the 4200 for heat right now they do have a new boiler and that's what the listing agent said in her description i know we got a picture this is a brand new boiler but that's it there's just one boiler for the whole building so instead of seven different furnaces you have to pay the heat as the landlord, right? And unfortunately, like we as landlords, we think that'll totally transfer, right? Like, for example, like if I have a $750 unit and it's got its own furnace, the tenant's paying heat. So we as landlords go, oh, well, this one I pay the heat, so I just ch charge them eight. It doesn't usually translate that. It doesn't translate in the real world, right? They Like they still will cap themselves off at 800. It's almost like they don't like necessarily put two and two together and think of that after the fact like uh it just is what it is right so this is just something you'll end up eating as a landlord okay uh so that's going to lower your return right so with all that said um i believe your return should be around thirteen thousand nine hundred forty-five. now 
like some of the other things I've calculated in there, right? These are variable expenses, people. Twenty two eighty for repairs and maintenance. Twenty two eighty for vacancy and non payment, okay? Twenty two eighty for CapEx, right? These are things like replacing that boiler, replacing the roof. We don't know that the the age of the roof. I would assume the roof is very old, and that's probably like a forty thousand dollar roof, right? So this two thousand two hundred eighty, this is what I'm having you guys save. You're saving this, right? You're not actually spending it. So technically what is that? That's like six thousand, that's like seven grand, which takes you back up to your twenty. So like the first year, maybe you keep all that seven grand. Maybe you don't have to spend that. You don't have any turn turnovers you probably won't have very many repairs right because most repairs happen at turnovers and you don't have to do a roof this year so you might get 20 but don't count that seven grand as an actual return right because i know you're gonna spend that right you're gonna be spending that when you turn units over you're gonna be spending that when you drop 40k on a new roof things of that nature right so your true return 13,945.04 in my opinion as close as i can get it right you can never fully fully estimate what a building is going to perform like right so with all that if you pay 280 you'll get it at a five cap which is pretty competitive uh in the 2021 market right the 2021 market there's a shortage of inventory especially uh small apartment buildings like this you'd be looking at a five cap now when i do these videos i normally also break it down for you guys with your finance product right let you know what kind of down payment you're going to need, things of that nature. But I never do them for apartment buildings. Lost my pen. Let me get another one. Never do them for apartment buildings, right? Never, never do them for apartment buildings because apartment building financing is more variable than your small multifamily residential financing. One to four unit buildings, okay, they're going to fall under 30-year fixed loans, right? You put down 25% for a non-owner-occupied property. The bank gives you 75%. They will approve you for the loan based upon your credit situation, your income situation, right? With apartment buildings, it's different. With apartment buildings, they look at the financials of the building. But I'm going to tell you from doing this for many years, selling over $200 million worth of real estate out here in the Cleveland market, you don't get solid financials in like well-kept records on these small apartment buildings. These are usually owned by mom and pops, right? So if you guys think you're going to get some fancy spreadsheets and all the tax returns and everyone's claiming their income accurately, you're fucking living in fairy tale land. That's not how it goes, right? So what like your terms are going to be is going to be totally variable, dude. Like you're probably not going to have the ability to put down 25%. You might have to put down 50, 60, but every lender looks at them very differently and every lender's got varying terms, right? If you guys want a list of commercial lenders, we got them. Send us an email, sales at holtonwise.com. But know that it's going to be different, right? Some people do 15 years fully amortized. Some people do 25-year AM, five-year call. I've seen 2010s, right? There's just so many different loan products out there and some lenders will loan on buildings in Ohio, to investors who live only in Ohio. Some will do buildings in Ohio to investors who live in like this many states and some will do this many states. And there's just so many variables. I can't really accurately predict what your financing terms are gonna be, right? Uh, so to go through those financing terms, you'll need to take the building schedule E's and just like a whole slew of documentation that your lender is gonna request uh, and go through the underwriting process. But you should not set yourself up to believe you're only going to have to put down 25%. I would say that is very, very unlikely, right? So that's my thoughts on this building. Worth 280 Is the seller going to be willing to take a $70,000 haircut? Maybe, maybe not. I don't think they're going to be willing to take that $70,000 haircut today because the building has only been on the market uh, for five days. But I don't see it moving at 350. So it might be something we put in that offer, right? We could put in the offer today at 280. Maybe they're not interested in it, but maybe two months from now, three months from now, they come back to us and maybe they're more interested, especially if it's a cash offer, right? Because I'm sure the seller knows how difficult it is for people to get the type of financing. One other thing I need to mention about this commercial financing too, five unit buildings, six unit buildings, seven unit buildings, those are the smallest buildings that uh, are qualifying for these commercial loans, right? Commercial lenders are not excited when a seven-unit apartment building that's 100 years old comes across their desk, right? Big loans pay big commissions, okay? 
little loans, pay little commissions, and often require more work out of them, right? So these are considered to be more risky uh, loan products for your lenders out there, right? So uh, when new investors are getting started, I often recommend they start uh, building their portfolios, utilizing their 10 available residential loans, right? You can get 10 30-year fixed interest loans. I think you should always take the first loan and buy yourself an owner-occupied house, less leaving you with nine residential mortgages, right? And then from there, you don't have to buy nine singles. You could buy nine doubles. That gives you 18 rental income checks. You could buy nine quads. That gives you 36 rental income checks, right? Only after you've exhausted those nine do I think it makes sense for you to start moving your capital into these bigger buildings with lower quality financing because you can no longer get that beautiful 30-year financing. But if you got nine residential mortgages left on the deck, dude, take those nine out first is what I tell most people, right? Because you'll never get terms that good. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.